Uh, thank you very much. So I would like to thank Professor Kass for, for the invitation to speak at the seminar. So um, I'd like to talk about some of the problems that uh, people in uh, group representation theory have been working on. And this is the number theory seminar. So I'm, I'm trying to explain how the, uh, you know, like how the result on those problems uh, help us like, uh, to, you know, like to, I mean, to approach some of the questions come from the, uh, that come from the uh, number theory and analytic geometry. Okay, so I'd like to talk about the uh, representation of similar group. So, okay, so uh, let me just uh, uh, mention some of, the, uh, some of the group that we are going to look at today. Of course, all of us know the uh, symmetry group on n letters, and then you have the ontogeny group on n letters. And if you have a finite dimensional vector space over something, say f, then you can associate with the uh, general linear group, the group of only li invertible linear transformation from V to V, the special linear group. And then if you, if you consider V with a form which is the non-degenerate, uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric, then you can look at the isometric group of the form, then you get the symmetric group, or maybe the, the orthogonal group. Now, if you take the fin f to be c, the fin of complex numbers, then you can see that this is just the, uh, the classical complex legal. But I am more interested in the case where your f is a finite fin, and then maybe instead of this, I'm going to write maybe G and N Q, S and N Q, S P and Q, O and Q, and so on. And you see that aside from this group, you may also have some more like uh, let me say exceptional and maybe twisted analog. I'm not going to describe them. And then if you vary the Q over on the powers of, of a given prime, and sometimes you want to take like a half interim power of this prime P, then what you have is something that you call the family of Li P. So this Li, and this is so-called the finite, finite groups of Li type in characteristic, say, P. So we fix the prime P here. Okay, so what is the, important of these groups. Now, of course you know that the, the final group Lee type, they provide the, the main source for the, for the finite non-abelian simple groups. Okay, and this is the classification, uh, the classification theorem, and you may or may not believe in it, but I believe in it. <laughs> and according to this theorem, then the, uh, the simple group are divided into three families. So the first one is the ontogeny groups. So this is the AN, or you end at least five. Then you have the, uh, the union of on the Lee P when you run over on the prime P, and this is a group of Lee type. And then you have one extra family of sporadic groups. So 26, sporadic simple group. Okay. Of course, if you look at this, the uh, this uh, description that I gave you, then you can say that I cheated because the group that I define most, uh, they are almost uh, never, uh, they can never be simple. But of course, to make it simple, then you have to take the uh, subgroup and move up in the center and stay away from the, some of the small exception but I'm going to ignore this uh, uh, technicality. Okay, so now, now that I have my group, then I can uh, describe the main problem on the reputation of this group, so the main problem. Okay, so given a simple group, G, so you can think of Sn, or maybe Sn and Q if you like, and given the fin f, I'd like to describe the finite dimension. Of course, the group is finite. Okay, so irreducible 
representation of your G over F. Well, as you know, the, uh, the representation theory of finite groups was born in, born in uh, April 1896 uh, in the letter corresponding between uh, Richard Dedekind and uh, Ferdinand George Frobenius. I think there were like three letters in April 1896. And you can tell me, well, in such an own theory, uh, what could still remain open? <laughs> and, and in fact, I can tell you that this main problem is still very much open. So let me just give you some example to convince you that this is the case. So here's an example. Well, let's just look at the group that we are all familiar with, the SN. Now, let's take the F to be the finite complex numbers. And then you know that there is a bijection between the irreducible representation of Sn over C and the set of partition of N, right? So given any partition lambda, then we can associate to it the uh, corresponding irreducible representation of Sn over C. So let me call it maybe phi upper lambda. So this is representation actually is called the spec module, but yeah, it doesn't matter. And then you can also look at the trace of this, and then you get the, the capital chi upper lambda. Okay. And now, if you give me an N, if you give me a partition lambda, then I can just use the, let's say, the, the hook formula to compute the dimension of the representation. If you give me a permutation, then I can use the uh, Frobenius character formula to compute the, the, the trace of this matrix at the permutation. Right? So, and the, of course, there are more and more results about this symmetric group. So, we seem to know everything about this, right? But here's one question. So, I want to know what is the maximum of the dimension of phi over lambda when I vary lambda over all the partition. So, I want to know what the largest degree of the complex irreducible representation of Sn over C like a function of n. And I want to have like maybe an explicit formula for this function. And nobody knows what the answer. Of course, there's an asymptotic answer. And it was given by, by work of Vershik and Kerov, and also by Logan and Sheff. I think in, uh, in the in the seventies, uh, and if you look at the the answer, then it's like uh, what you do is like you you take the order of the of the symmetric group, which is n factorial, you divide by the partition function, which is the number of representation, and the answer is would be something like that. So, and also we you know what is the what the shape of the representation of the partition, which give you the largest uh, degree, but but that's that's what you have. Even though this is an asymptotic answer, but it was widely used in many, many applications, like, you know, like, for instance, when you do something, some kind of statistic with the SN, or you do the random work on the SN, then we need this kind of uh, result. Okay, so now let me, uh, let me change the field, and, okay, so now, instead of the fin of comics numbers, let me look at the, a small Boltzmann fin, so now it's just a fin of, of two elements. Okay, and again, there is a bijection between the irreducible representation of Sn over F2 over fin of two elements and the set of so called strict partition of N. This means that you divide your N into uh, distinct parts. Okay. And again, so let's say your n is 100, and then you take lambda to be something like maybe 70, 21, and 9, something like that. And then you can associate it, the uh, corresponding representation of Sn over F2, so like could maybe psi upper lambda, for instance. And now again, you can ask what the dimension of this psi upper lambda. 
and even the dimension, we don't know. So if you pick some, some n like that, you pick a random uh, strict partition, then we don't know what is the dimension. And the problem is like, even though we, we know everything about the complex representation for the given n, but when you reduce, reduce more two, then you don't know how to decompose this, and that's the main problem. So I hope that I have convinced you that this, this is like a hard problem, right, or the main problem. So, okay, so let's try to, if you don't know how to do this problem, let's try to look at some special instances of this problem, some special cases. So instead of this, um, so maybe the next sub-problem or maybe problem one for me. Um, so if you cannot, if you can describe this representation, can we, can you find a natural way to label them? Of course, what does it mean to be natural? It depends on the way you look at it, but okay, so here's a question that you have to look at. And for instance, if you look at the Russian representation of reductive group, then you know that you can label the model using the high weight. So you want to, you want to somehow develop some kind of weight theory for the finite groups. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is the problem that I have to look at. And so now let me go back to this. And so let me, let me give you some technical definition. Okay, so let G be a finite group and let F be a fin which is closed. And let's say the characteristic of this fin is P, is a prime P, then by a weight, or maybe a P weight, to be more precise, of G, we mean a pair Q comma delta, where what is a Q and delta? So Q is a P subgroup. So it means that the order is just a power P of G and delta is an irreducible representation of the quotient of the normalizer of Q by Q. And I have the condition that if I look at the dimension of delta and I look at the P part of this integer, then it should be the P part of the order of the quotient, like this. So this is just to say that the, uh, this representation has P B effect zero. Okay. And now there is a conjecture stated by Jonathan Anperin, the so-called Anperin weight conjecture, now we call it conjecture of uh, so Jonathan Anperin from 1990s, 1986. Okay, so he say that uh, given such a G and given such a P, then there should be a bijection between the isomorphism classes of irreducible representation of your G over F and the G conjugate classes of the P weights. Okay, so if the conjecture is true, then we may have a way to label the modular representations, modular irreducible representation of your group using weight like we did for the, uh, for the reductive groups. And, and in, in some sense, the, the way that he defined the notion of weight was more and after the final group lead type, the situation of the final group lead type. So I have to tell you again that this conjecture is in uh, open. And so even though we can prove it for some special classes of final groups, but in general, it's in open. So what do you do? How can you prove this conjecture? How can you try to prove this conjecture? Now, we mentioned that we have this uh, classification of finite simple groups. And you know that every finite group is been up from the simple pieces. So maybe one hope is like, well, maybe we could try to use the classification and try to reduce the conjecture to the simple groups. And you hope that if you know uh, enough about the simple group, then maybe you can prove the, the conjecture. Of course, when, when you do that, that doesn't mean that you just have to prove the, this conjecture for the simple groups. You have to prove this conjecture and much more for the simple group in order to be able to prove it for the, for the n final groups. And in fact, such a reduction has been obtained recently. So this is a reduction theorem. 
uh, due to Gabriel Navarro and myself. So, so fix the prime p. Then we prove that. So suppose that. Suppose that that every finite non-abelian simple group has a order division by p by this prime p is uh, something that you call AWC Amprin weight conjecture good for the prime p. Okay. Then, then you can conclude that, that the Amprin weight conjecture, oh, I forgot to say that I denote it by AWC, Holmes for all finite groups and for the prime P, for the, this prime P. Okay. So, of course, the main thing is what is this condition here? What is the AWC goodness? Well, at least it includes that the conjecture, the Andrew Quake conjecture, should be true for the Stephen group, but even much more. And in fact, I, I have to tell you that this like about two pages of uh, technical condition on the simple group, on the uh, on the Eurasian cover of the group, on the uh, uh, representation, extension, and cohomology about this group. Okay, so you can you can tell me that doesn't make any sense. Instead of proving this short, nice statement, I uh, we propose that we go about proving like a very long list of technical condition for every simple group. That doesn't make any sense, but uh, but at the moment this is the only way that uh, that uh, the people in in group theory think that you can approach this conjecture. Yes. Right. Okay. So so the maybe the smallest thing is like you want to show that the two set have the same cardinality, and maybe the uh, maybe the uh, the ideal situation is like not only that you show that they have the same cardinality, but they have some kind of uh, good bijection, like you know, like equivalent. So, uh, in, yeah, this kind of thing. Yes. So that what 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 you want? Yeah, right. Um, and in fact, this goodness involves this kind of like you know, like the we, we conjecture that there should be some some equivalent bijection for the Simon case. Yeah. Okay. So now, but let me tell you. So for which Simon group we know that they are AWC good. So, so which Simons? Are AWC good for the prime P? Well, now we have the list of simple group, right? So, okay. Well, first we have the containing groups, and they are all good. This is a work uh, by uh, Mutomala. Then uh, we have twenty-six for each simple group. Okay, so a finite list. We can check that everything is okay, right? And then we we have the lead type group, right? And we can also show that they are good. This is due to Navarro and myself. So apparently we are done, but <laughs> not quite because I use p for the two different thing for this p and also for the other p. So this is. So yes, if the two prime are the same, then yes, they are good. <laughs> so the main problem now, so the main obstacle, or main, the main, main problem for us now, for us now is, is to show that that the Lee, Lee type group, but in the other characteristic. So let's put Lee P prime. They are also AWC good for the prime P. And and to do that, that we we need to study something like the problem that I mentioned to you, like the action of the outer automorphism on the on this uh, sim, uh, on the representation of simple groups, for instance. Okay. So this is one special case of the main problem that I want to uh, describe to you, and here's another problem that uh, a sub problem that I want also to look at. Okay. So to do that, maybe I need. Uh, if you allow me, maybe I'm going to write it here. So I need another um, notion, technical notion. So given 
a simple group G and a prime P, then you have the fin F as before. Right? Okay. And so I'm to denote by D sub P of G the smallest but larger than one degree of a phase spoon irreducible representation of G over F. Of course, if any. You see that if the center of G is not cyclic, then you don't have such a thing, but, uh, but I assume they, uh, they exist. So I'm going to ignore the, the smallest one, and then I, the linear one, and then I go for the next one, and that will be the, this invariant, this P of G. And now I can formulate the problem that I have to look at. So for the, for the simple G and for the prime P, what I have to do is I want to describe, uh, maybe to determine the exact value of this d sub p of g. And not only that I want to find the value of this invariant, but I want also to classify the irreducible representation of g over f, but up to the degree, which is the square of this invariant. Okay. So you can, you can tell me that the choice of, uh, of the bound that I want to work with is kind of a random one. You know, why, why you know about the square, but not like the cube or force power or something. But it turns out that, that I mean, like um, the form for, for a number of applications that you have in mind, um, that uh, this is the bound that you want to work with. If you know enough about the representation of smaller degree and the next one up to the square of the smaller degree, that would be enough for us to solve some of the questions coming from other areas. Okay, so this is the second problem that I want to look at. And so let me try to, to report on, on a result on this problem. Okay, so again, we look at the, the list of simple group. And so, so the first one is, Suppose that your G is a sporic simple group. Okay. Now, in this case, the problem is being studied by people that we, are, that we refer to as the, the gap people. So the gap for group algebra programming. So there's a computer package to do computation in groups, algebra, and then so that the people in Aachen, in St. Andrews, and you know, like, so, and for instance, if you want to look at the D sub P of G, then we know it, and this is the, uh, uh, this was done by Christoph Janssen in 2005. But you see, this is just the first part of the problem when you want to find the, this invariant. But if you want to know these uh, small representations, then for instance, if you pick your favorite group, G to be just a monster, and let's say you pick the prime two, then the problem is still open. So, or param three, it's the same thing. We know what is the smallest one. Uh, for, th for this group, the smallest degree is gonna be 196,882. Um, but, uh, but you don't know well, what are the, what are the representation of this degree. So there's at least one, but maybe there are more than one, but we don't know, yeah. Okay, so uh, should I avoid writing on this board? Can you, can you see it? Okay. So next, we want to look at the symmetric group, the alternating group. And you know, like sometime when you work with a symmetric group and alternating group, then you also have to look at the central extension of this group. So you're going to have the double cover of Sn and, and An. Then if your P, if the prime P is zero, then this is just about the complex representation. So this is the easy case. You can do, you can do it using the Classical theory of the Frobenius, Schur, Young, so there's no problem. Uh, so the main case would be where your P is positive, and maybe you should say that P is at most N. Um, so for the SN and AN, then this was done by Gordon James 
in the 80s. But if you want to look at the, uh, the double cover of SN and, and AN, so if you want to talk about the so-called moral spin limitation of the SN and AN, then only about 30 years later, it was done by Sasha Klyshev and, and myself. So 2012. So for instance, I can give you the formula. So let's say that you want to, to look up the D sub P of, let's say, the double curve of SN. So it's going to be something like this, 2 to the uh, integer part of n minus 1 minus uh, kappa divided by 2, where, what is the kappa? Kappa is 1 if you p, let me see. Uh, I think it's right. If p divide n, and 0 if p doesn't divide n, something like this. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so now we, we can turn our attention to the, to the main family of simple groups, namely the group of Lie type. And you want to know, what do you know about the, the small dimension representation of the simple groups? Okay, so now I think that I have to be careful. So I have different prime here. So so now my group G is going to be like something in the R. So like G is S and then Q. Q is a power of R. I is a prime. And I want to study this problem. So I'm going to have this prime P and this prime R. So I have two prime. So case one, let's assume that these two prime are the same. So it turned out this is the, the easy case for this problem. Because we can just use the, the, uh, the high weight, high weight modern theory for the uh, simple element groups. And also, we can use another technical result due to Sasha Premet. Sasha Premet theorem to solve the problem. OK, so the Premet theorem just tell you that uh, somehow the representation of simple analytic groups over C and over the uh, the, uh, the, the FP, they seem to be the same in some sense. So if you look at the weight, so the, the set of weight are almost, I think, uh, are almost the same, except for some special cases. Okay, um, right, so, um, so the second case where your P is not equal to R. Okay, right, and now, again, I have two subcases. So the first subcase is, when your P is zero or P doesn't divide the group order. So this is a case of the complex representation. Okay, then in this case, we are very fortunate to have the uh, very powerful theory developed by the pro by, by Professor Deling and Lustig. Theory, so and using this theory, you can just answer this problem. And you can even go up if you need to, like to the fourth power or maybe the 10th power if, if you want for this problem. So this is the, uh, the good case. And so the main case for us is where your P is positive, P is not R, and P divide the group order. Okay, so many people have been working on this problem. And let me just give you a sample of result that you have in this uh, circle of question. So let me just mention a theorem due to Bob Guranik. And myself. So I'm going to say that, 
that we we saw this the problem two for the SFN Q. And in particular, I can give you a formula, the formula for the D sub P of S and Q. So, so it's going to be Q to the N minus 1 over Q minus 1 minus 1, if you P doesn't divide, Q to the N minus 1 over Q minus 1, and 2 if you P divide. OK. And then you can show that the next degree would be something like this, plus one, and so on. Yeah, and then there, there's going to be a big gap until the next square. Okay, so, but I'm not going to formulate like other uh, result like this because they are already two, uh, the two tetragon. So, so now let me let me go to the second part of my talk and let me try to describe to you that. Oh, so, what do you get from this kind of result? So, what kind of application that you can have? Um, so, so the first application that I can mention is, so they are, so this kind of reason has been used for the, for the revision of the proof of the classification of the Paris symmetry group. So you know that there have been a lot of efforts uh, to revise, to refine these uh, 15, normally 1,000 or 15,000 or 20,000 page proof of the classification of the Paris symmetry group. And so this kind of result has been used to, to let's say, to, to identify uh, the, some of the models that were defined by John Thompson, to identify John Thompson quadratic, quadratic model, whatever it means, and some other thing. OK. Also, they have been used in the commutation group theory. group theory. So suppose that uh, you have a, a collection of permutation of degree, let's say, 200. And so you want to know what's the group created by this permutation. And now there is a software to do it. And the theory behind this software is it is can result about the uh, representation of Siemens groups. So we know what is the structure of the group created by matrices or permutation of not too big degree. But again, I'm not going to talk about this kind of application, but I'm going to talk about some question uh, that come from number theory and other geology. Oh, uh, you mean the? Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so um, so this is like uh, you look at the uh, stabilizer, stabilizer of one line, and then you induce induce the achievement representation, and you decompose, and you see that. Uh, you split up like one or two pieces depending on whether the P uh, divide or doesn't divide. Uh, you see that uh, it's easy to, 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 to guess that you get such a representation, but the main thing is to show that this is the only one. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, so that's the second part, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so, so f uh, let me talk about a problem raised by Janusz Kola. And Michael Larsen problem. Okay, so now our V is going to be an n-dimensional vector space over C, and we are going to consider it with a standard permission product. Okay. Um, so suppose that you have an, a transformation of your V, which preserves the form, so it's going to be a unitary transformation. Then you know that you can diagonalize your G, so G is going to be conjugate to a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are just the eigenvalues. And you're going to write like E to the 2 pi I RJ, where you, chose the, where you choose the exponent to be between 0 and 1. Oh, let me say it's U. Yeah, right. So G for gerund, but some people don't write the G. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, and so here's the definition due to mind read. 
So he said that we should define the the h, which is g, to be the sum of these exponents. And then, uh, and then we are going to say that your g is young or or, or rather junior. If the h of your g is positive, but less or equal to one. So this is like a very uh, strict definition of being young. <laughs> so let me give you some example of, of junior transformation. So example, well, you can look at like a reflection. So they mean that you're going to have like a negative one and one and one like this, right? And you can see that the h of this is going to be one half. Or you can also look at a complex reflection. So now we have some alpha and one, 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 right? And then you see that the h of this is going to be strictly between zero and one. Or you can also look at a by reflection. So we have two negative one and one, one, one like this. Then you see that the h is, is one. Okay. Um, and so you see that the junior element, they are very much related to the, uh, to the reflection uh, and by reflection and so on. Right. So yeah, I think why didn't I just go here and Okay, so here's the problem that you want to study. So we want to classify, oh, let me say describe the finite irreducible subgroups, say G of G and V that are generated by my junior element. In fact, uh, Kolai Larsen also made like a very precise conjecture We say the following. So suppose that suppose that you have a finite subgroup of G and V, finite irreducible, and suppose that for every non-sentient element of your G, if the H of this element X is less than one, then your G is generated, can be generated by, by the conjugate of this x. So by g, x, g inverse, where you let g run over on the element. Okay. So, um, um, so I think that Kona and Larsen call this kind of thing, they call it like a um, RT pairs. R for rip and T for tie, I think, yeah. So then the conclusion is then, up to scalars. Your G is actually a complex reflection group. So therefore known by by the classification of Shepard and Todd. From I think from nineteen fifty four, I think. Okay. So this is the problem that was stated by Kula Larsen. Um so I should say something about the motivation behind this uh, conjecture and problem. So, okay, so the first motivation came from work of, of Kohlein Larsen on, on quotient of 
color be our varieties. So G is the finest subgroup of the orthomorphic group of these of these color be our varieties. And so Kolai Larsen showed that some of the characteristics of this quotient uh, they depend on whether the action of a point stabilizer on the tangent space contain a junior element or not. So I guess it's gonna be uh, and the second motivation come from the uh, the interest in Craven resolution of quotient varieties. Okay, so so suppose that your G is a finite subgroup of G and B like we have in here, and then we can look at the the quotient of V by G, and you want to know. So, so, so the question is, so when? Okay, so the question is, when does this quotient admit a Craven resolution? And so, what is the connection between between Craven resolution and the uh, and the notion of junior element that you have in here? Uh, and the connection comes from a criterion due to Ito and Fritz. So they say that. So let me say here. So V or G admit a Craven resolution. So if um, yeah, you can you can normalize this. Oh, so okay, so so you look at a um, so let's you look at a, a resolution and then uh, so the uh, resolution is going to be Craven if there's no discrepancy. So that means that uh, it's okay, yeah. So it's Craven if, if Kx is if f star Ky. So usually we have some discrepancy like a linear combination of the exception dividers and so on. But suppose that these have no discrepancy that is called Craven. Yeah, so if V mod G admit the Craven re resolution, then G contain junior element. Okay, so this is connection. And uh, so now we, s we see why you want to study the, the linear groups which are generated by the junior element. Um, okay, so, so, What do you know about these two problem? Okay, so here's the theorem. Again, due to Bob Kuranik. and myself, and I'm I'm going to say in a very vague way that <laughs> that we solve the 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 KN problem. You know, because the the description that you have is is quite technical. You know, it's, it's too much group theoretic, and I don't want to present it here. But but I can say in a more definite way that. That we prove the prove the the Kula Larsen conjecture, and I should say that the the conjecture is true if if your n is at least five, if your n is four or smaller, then we then the, the, the conjecture. I mean, uh, the conjecture is not true, and and Kula Larsen knew it, so they put it when your n is at least five. Okay, so as a corollary, so I'm going to put it in quote. Not because it's, it's not true, but because it's, uh, uh, it's just so we get evidence, some evidence that 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 Crippen resolution of C and mod G K 
tend to, I'm going to put it in quote, tend to occur mostly in low dimension. So if you take n to be two or three, then, then you can come up with, with a quotient variety with the Kepler resolution. But if your n is higher, then, then it's very hard to, to get uh, something which admits Kepler resolution or something which is not terminal. Um, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. So V is, a, V is, a, yeah, it, it was somewhere. Yeah, V is, a, uh, the v is n dimension, yes. Right, so here's one application, and uh, so another application that I want to mention is about uh, the notion of adequate subgroup. Um, so um, let me mention that uh, the uh, the proof of Andrew Weil of the Fermat theorem used some result which was proved by Richard Taylor and Andrew White, which, which you know as the modularity leaping theorem. So it says the following. So suppose that your P is an odd prime and Suppose that you have a two-dimension Lala representation. Okay, so O is some ring of periodic integers. And let's suppose that that we know that phi looks like coming from a modular form. So this is actually like a, some some condition imposed on the on the let's say on the decomposition uh, subgroup at some prime, and the second condition would be like now you can you can reduce the representation phi mod p. So let's say this is a phi bar. So now it's go from GQ, and you can think of think of it going into the closure of FP. And now we assume that this really coming from a modular form. And we have a third condition. We say that the image under the phi bar of the Gala group of Q extended by, by a root, a square root of P up to a sign, and you want this to be big. OK. Then under this condition, then the conclusion is you can lift the modularity from phi bar to phi, then your phi is modular. Okay. Of course, I didn't say what does it mean to be big. So here, the big bigness, it just means irreducible. Okay, and some is later. In, I think in 2010, uh, Mike and Harris, Nick Shepard Baron, and George Taylor prove a uh, important case of the Sato Tate conjecture, and then they use another leading theorem. So now it's a, a theorem for leading automorphy. Leading theorem. So which was proved by Laurent Claude and Mike and Harris. Taylor in 2008. So I'm going to say that they generalize the Taylor Wine theorem, but replacing GN2 by GN and also Monra by automorphic. Okay, and now what does it mean to be big? And I think the condition is imposed on the GQ adjoined by the period of unity. So what does it mean to be big here? So 
so it's a big now mean irreducible as before plus sum of condition plus the existence of a of an element in the Galois group with a with a special uh, multiplicity one eigenvalue. Okay. So so again we have this condition imposed on the on the image of some subgroup of the Galois of the Galois group. So in 2012, a Jackson, he generalized further this theorem. Generalized the, the Grothen Harrison Taylor theorem. And he removed this condition. So re removing the, the multiplication condition. And thus, replacing the bigness by something that he could adequate, adequacy. Okay, so now let me uh, let me give you the definition of adequate subgroups. Um, so the division is, so again, F is a scene which is closed of characteristic, say C, and so G is a subgroup of G and V, finite, irreducible. So you say that G is adequate if if you have three conditions. So the first one is that H1 of G with three even coefficient is vanishing. The second condition is H1 of G with the coefficient in the quotient of the endomorphism algebra of V, but you move out by center. So F times 1V. Um, is zero. And maybe the most important condition, we want the space, the vector space, and the V to be linearly spanned by all the element in G, which have order co prime to P. So I'm going to say P prime element, meaning the order is co prime to P. Okay, so that's the condition. Um, so, of course, what, what you have to do here? Well, you see that in the first listing theorem, then the condition was that the image should be irreducible. And now we have some more condition, and now we have a little bit less condition. So the goal is like to show that, well, maybe you just have to rely on the irreducibility. So, so our, our goal is, is to show that that most most irreducible subgroup of GLV are already adequate. Okay, so so now I can formulate some results on the adequacy. So, so the the, uh, the first theorem, which was proved by Puranik, Florian Hersik, uh, Richard Taylor, and Jack Stone in 2012, uh, say the following. So, if you know the dimension of V is very small compared to the characteristic, then everything's fine. So. If you know that the dimension, of, did I say n is the dimension? <coughs> yes, 
you add inside that V is F to the N. OK, so let me say if the dimension of B, it less than or equal to P minus 3 over 2, then G is adequate. OK. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, right. And you see that you can see this condition implies that it has to be irreducible to begin with. Yeah, the third condition. Yeah, so um, um, so this result is already uh, is already used to prove some new leading theorem. And now, but of course you have this condition, right? And you want to extend it uh, beyond this bound. And you can see that B seems to be the right upper bound that you can work with. When you step to the dimension B and higher, then you have a lot of like yeah, anomalies. So here's a theorem that Bob and Florian and me prove. So, uh, so we put the following. So again, in the above notation, and okay. So okay, so let me repeat it. So suppose that. G is a sub of G and V, finite, irreducible. And I'm to look at something that we denote by G plus. So G plus is a sub of G, which is related by all the P element, all the element of order of power P in G. OK, this is just a notation. And the condition is that the dimension of any irreducible G plus submodule in V is less than P. OK. Then you want to conclude that G is adequate, but we do have some exception. Then aside from a few explicit exception, G is adequate. OK. Um, and actually, an exception comes from the thing that you use for your construction, the weight rotation of S and 2P. Yeah. Right. Uh, I also want to mention that along the way, we can also get some byproducts. So. So there are two byproducts here that I want to mention. One is we can answer a question of Jean Piercer about something that that uh, Sir called the so-called G C R C for complete and R for reduce reduced one subgroup, where now your G is either the symmetric group or the oblong group. And also, another byproduct would be like, uh, we get some answer to a question of uh, Barry Mazur. So uh, if you look at this, uh, these two conditions closely, then you can see that actually we can combine them together. And what you have is like, you want to show that the x, tank, uh, the, the x, x1 between v and v is vanishing. So in the exception, we don't have the vanishing of the x1 functor. And, uh, and Mazur asks, can you bound the dimension of this x1 between v and v? And in fact, we can do it. So you get a bound on the x1 between v and v, and also x1 between v and v dual in this, uh, in this situation that we have in this, uh, in this theorem. OK. Um, so I think I should. Uh, I should start here, but you know, like there's some uh, very recent development that actually came out of in my discussion with Professor Kass yesterday. So, if you allow me, can I take like, a couple of minutes to mention that development? Sure. Okay. Thank you. And this this question is is also related to the representation of of simple groups at the induction base.
So uh, this is about something that uh, was defined by Yang Tian, and he called it the anti-invariant. Okay, so um, so if you have a, a manifold X, um, so for instance, for instance, like a, a, a final manifold, and then Gang Chan defined in in 1987, some some in, so G is a compact subgroup of the automorphic group of this X. It's compact. Then he defines something that he called alpha sub G of X, and he showed that if this alpha invariant is big enough. Then, then this X admit a G invariant Keller Einstein matrix. Um, so, for instance, you can look at the case where your X is just the, the positive, positive space, and G is a, is a um, well, I'm going to say this in the GNNC, is finite. Then it's, it turned out that this alpha sub G of X is something that uh, uh, another geometers called the, uh, the log. Canonical threshold of P and G. I'm not an algebraic geometer, so I am not going to <laughs> to define what does it mean. But this is the log canonical threshold. And for instance, if this is bigger than one, then the quotient of this uh, of the C n over G is it exceptional. It's less than one, then it's non exceptional. Okay. So the question is, can you say something about this? And even before the, the invariant was uh, defined, John Thompson proved some reason about this invariant. So here's a theorem due to John Thompson in 1981. So he showed that if your G is any subgroup of the NC, is finite, then this alpha sub G of, of P and S1 can be bounded linearly in terms of n. Namely, he showed that it's at most full time n. And, and in the same paper, he had a conjecture that it should be bounded universally. So, so the, there, is a, there is a constant C started for all the finite subgroup. Finite, the alpha sub G of this is less, is at most C. Of course, what is the connection? I mean, how, how, how did John Thompson look at it even before the, the question was, I mean, the alpha invariant was defined? So the connection was the following. Uh, you can see that in this case, the alpha sub G of this P and minus one is at most the, the minimum degree of semi invariant of G. So the minimum of K such that the K symmetric power of P, so what is V of C upper N, contain a one dimension. G submodule. Okay, divide by the dimension of P, which is N. Okay, let me divide by N. Okay, so we show that this number is at most full time N square, and that's why you have this result. Okay, so I, I have been thinking about this conjecture, and there was one case that I I couldn't see how to do it, but yesterday I discussed it with uh, Professor Kass, and he gave me the hint how to do it. So I think that I can, now I can uh, announce the theorem, but I mean to put a bit like a, like a star here, meaning that I still have to check on the detail and everything, that this conjecture is true. Okay. Um, unfortunately, my C is implicit, so uh, I hope that I can make it explicit. Yeah. Thank you very much.